What's going on everybody and welcome back to Unplayable. I'm D House here with another deck tech video for you. This is actually the deck that I played recently at Gen Con in a couple of the large events and on the Saturday large event ended up it with a five and two record uh, landing me outside the bubble. There were five and twos that made top 16, but I, uh, because of my tiebreakers, ended up in 24th. Still felt great about the day. One of my losses was to the seven and oh Boba Yellow deck. And uh, another one, another loss was to Boba Yellow. Uh, sort of misplayed at the end. It could have ended any number of ways, but still felt great about it. Wanted to record this video about w what's in the deck. And there's already changes I'd probably make, but I wanted to talk about what I did play. There's some other uh, decks like this out there that you can find if you're really interested in learning more, but really enjoyed this. So let's just get right into it. All right, this deck is called Sad Han. Sad Han. Um, why Sad Han? Well, let's talk about why Sad Han. Sad Han because if you think about Han Solo's life, it was a lot of sad moments. The dude fell in love at a young age, you know, was super smitten and was, you know, brutally separated from her, worked, you know, for a long time to get back to her only to lose her to a murderous psychopath in Dryden Voss. And then actually she just abandoned Han Solo anyways and went with a different murderous psychopath in Maul. And uh, she literally went to like the worst guys possible. She left the good guy. Why be the good guy when she's going for the bad guys, right? So she, he lost Kira. And in that process, he had to murder and shoot his mentor and Tobias Beckett, this father figure. He had to kill his own father figure and, and, and beat him to the draw, which is super sad. He eventually gets recruited by the Rebel Alliance. He meets this woman who drives him nuts, but... He's like, oh, maybe, maybe I, maybe I love this girl. Maybe there's a future here. And then he gets frozen in carbonite by his best friend. I mean, come on, man. He ends up in carbonite for a long time, stuck in Jabba the Hutt's palace, comes out. He's lost his eyesight, at least for a little bit. But eventually everything kind of works out for a little bit, gets married, has a son. And oh, yeah, his son kills him. You're asking me, why is it sad, Han? That's why. That's why it's sad, Han. Han's dead. And his son murdered him. He's a sad Han. Okay, so let's get into the deck. <laughs> this is sad Han. It's blue Han. Get it? Blue Han. Sad Han. All right. So, so here's the deck. And we're going to talk about first why I got on this deck. The reason I initially got on this deck is because during set one of Star Wars Unlimited, I was all about cheer it red, blue, red hero deck. I really enjoyed that combination of colors and I was actually starting to work on an updated set two version of Chirrut and I saw some random conversations happening around Red, this new uh, uh, Han leader and what he can do and combining that with blue to add some force people and continue to have force throw because let's, let's be honest, force throw, one of the greatest cards in the game. And so I started looking at Han and I thought, well, maybe it's the same color combination. Let's see if we can just take the Chirrut shell and throw Han in there and see what we can make. So Han is all about value, cheating out units before they're supposed to get out. You know, the game is balanced around certain power levels coming out at certain resources and Han literally breaks that and allows you to cheat them out for the really low cost of a couple damage if they're not prepared to do damage to to you then you are really are just uh way out ahead of them so so han being able to cheat out units he comes out at five and on his uh on his unit side he can actually do it multiple times like you could play a a four cost unit and a three cost unit on that turn which is the, kind of similar to like what boba fett's trying to do although he gets up to eight resources so there's just there's just a lot of value to be had here and so uh so we'll just talk the first part of why i wanted to play this deck was what i call value town value town population han solo so so han gets to cheat out some pretty amazing units earlier than they're supposed to be on the board so first we have poe dameron a new legendary very popular probably the most expensive legendary of the new set comes in as five as a six six with a bunch of really cool abilities on attack you're able to if you want to again this is not a have to this is a if you want to you can play poe dameron on the four resource turn and and drop this sucker in there against aggro decks that really don't want to have to deal with your units all of a sudden there's this massive threat that can ping two damage on a unit can kill something else and still survive he basically requires an answer so being able to play this at four 
is pretty massive. Luke Skywalker, you get to drop this guy at six, which is crazy. But you know, anytime Luke enters the game, it usually alters the game because you're usually nuking a unit and you're putting a six, seven unit out there that has restore three. Yes, he'll only have five health, but I'll take it. I, I, you know, really you're looking at takedown and other stuff that really has to hit that level of health still. So playing Luke at six feels really, really good. And then you just start ramping up the curve. So if you're dropping Luke at six, now you get to play Chewbacca at seven. Now Chewbacca is a new unit from um, Shadows of the Galaxy that hasn't really found a home in any other decks, but in this deck specifically, it works because you get to play it cheaper and it has grit, which takes the damage from Han and turns it into power. So you get to play Chewbacca at seven, comes in as essentially a six eight. And then when you play it, you get to defeat a unit with five or less remaining health. So maybe you killed something with Luke the turn before at six, and then at seven, you're nuking something else uh, with Chewbacca and that gets behind shields. And it just feels really, really strong. It feels really strong. So you like seeing Luke into Chewie. And then if you don't want to play Chewbacca, if maybe you're playing aggro deck and you need to save some health, you can always drop redemption at seven. Yes, you take the two damage. So you only really can take an additional like six more damage. You can heal six, but you also have a Sentinel unit out there. So there were many times when I played this where redemption would just get out there and stand in front of a couple of uh, tie defenders or a fire spray and just say, all right, I healed a bunch and you can you can kill me, but you're going to die too. So you can play it. You can cheat it if you want to, if you're in a bind. Again, more value. And then of course the top end, another new unit, the crate dragon, dropping the dragon at eight resources, a 10-10 with overwhelm. And then every time the opponent plays a card, you get to deal damage to the base, to unit, where wherever you want to. This was so fun to play uh, to play dragons out. There was one game I was playing against a Vader green deck and and she was actually ramping. She had super later techs and resupplies. So she was trying to get to the dragon first. And I remember I did an early claim uh, going into eight resources when she was going into nine to be able to drop my dragon before she could drop her dragon. So and it just won the game. I mean, just straight up right there. So. This is Value Town USA, and there are some other units that we'll get to that you could play in this in these spots, but it's absolutely sweet, to, and it feels great. It just feels great playing those. Next up, the next part of the game plan here is Operation Discard. Okay, so one thing this deck can do is absolutely destroy your opponent's hand. So we've got Force Throw, probably one of my favorite cards in the game. You know, one cost, you choose a player to discard a card, so at, at worst, you're paying one to discard a card from your opponent's hand. It's not, that's not great value, but it's also not bad, especially if they've drawn into two, they've resourced one and they have one card in hand, you're going first. You can just eliminate their turn. But on the top end, and we'll get into the force units later, you can actually discard and deal damage for that. Another card we just got was pillage for cost. You make somebody discard two, pretty simple. Pretty powerful too. So pillage and force throw together. Again, those work on Han's flip turn as well if you really need to. I mean, it's three cards. K2SO, most times with K2, I'm actually discarding cards. I'm not doing damage. It's a little bit of the secret of this deck is that I'm not I'm not going super aggro. I'm really just playing to my top end and and uh, and hoping to get there. There are some unique circumstances where the damage is helpful, but I do not mind cheating out K2SO at three resources, leaving them out as a 4-2. If they want to kill him on the four resource turn, then they can do that. I'm going to discard a card from their hand with K2 and then I'm going to hit them with a pillage and they've now discarded three cards on the four resource turn. A lot of times you're just, you put them in top deck mode and you start dropping these bigger units and they can't do anything about it because they're just trying to get cards out and have something to play. So so K2 is absolutely phenomenal in this deck specifically for the for the discard. Because a lot of times if they don't kill, then you can just overwhelm one of their units, kill something, uh, have some board control and then discard. And then put Dameron. I don't use his ability to discard a card that often because you also have to give up a card, but in the right circumstance, it, that's certainly an option. Again, same deal where if you drop him at four, going into the five resource turn, sometimes you might want to get rid of a card and also pillage them so that they're going down three cards. So Han Solo, he's cheating you out of your money. He's getting rid of all your resources and all of a sudden you don't have a hand. And a lot of times that's just how you, how you win with this deck. All right, so I mentioned Force Throw. Han's got some friends. They feel bad for him. He's sad all the time. He needs some buddies. So Jedi's that feel bad for Han are Yoda, Kanan, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and Luke Skywalker. 
So when I was running the Cheerit version of Blue Red Hero, Cheerit comes out and he's, he's, he sticks to the board for a long time and you can pretty reliably force throw. Obviously Han is not force sensitive that we know of, but he likes his buddies that can force throw things. So Yoda drops and with, with force throw, now you're doing damage with whatever you're doing. A lot of times in the Boba matchup, it's really easy. They, they flip Boba. I have a, a Kanan sticking on the board that I just played. And it's because I have five resources, one, you know, four for Kanan, they drop Boba. I force throw my own Redemption or Chewbacca or Dragon into Boba to just one shot nuke him. It's an it's an easy one turn play. I, I think I did that to a Dark Sabered Sabine as well. I hit it with a dragon or hit her with a dragon. It feels great. Sometimes it's hard to decide whether you want to give up your top end, but you have to survive in order to get to your top end. So a lot of times it's just, uh, it just feels good. Obi-Wan Kenobi's on here. I should note that you can cheat Obi-Wan Kenobi out on the five resource turn when you're flipping Han. So if you time it well, you can drop him. He turns into a five cost four, four with Sentinel, which isn't great. But then when he dies, he gives obviously two experience. And if you have a force unit like Yoda or Kanan out there, uh, it just feels good. The other thing I want to say is I I'm typically not cheating out Yoda because having a two, two with restore two on the first turn isn't, isn't great unless you have no other options. Kanan, however, uh, I usually didn't mind cheating Kanan out as a three cost four, three with that on attack ability. The reason being it, it turns on the, the force throws for the next turn. But in, at worst case, you're thinking this you're what you're doing is you're playing an echo based defender. So it's now a four, three. If they ignore it, great. If they don't, if they decide to put throw their Sabine into it or Battlefield Marine or whatever, great. It was basically a Sentinel for a turn. You're, you're kind of stalling the early turns and just surviving and controlling things so that you can get to your top end. So playing out Kanan at three never really feels bad. Playing at four is fine as well. I think four health is one of those areas you have to be aware of, especially against Boba, because like four Lom ambushes at four. You've got the, the those who are still running Bosk ambushes at four. So sometimes you want to play Kanan at five health so that you don't end up giving them a free kill, but you just, you have to do what you gotta do. So yeah, that's that. Next up, we've got our tech cards. Tech, uh, tech is a card and it is very good. <laughs> if, if you get nothing else from this video, tech is a very good card. So coming out at, at three cost, two five, I actually did not run tech on day one of the large events and I swerved for the next day and I only put one in. And this is a card that probably if I decide to keep playing this, I would add more tech. One, he can smuggle in at four, which is awesome. And then when he gets on the board, he gives everything smuggle, which is so powerful. When you're talking about force throws in your in your resource row or crate dragons that you had to give up early to survive to the to the end, I actually did win a game when I I ended up at uh, eleven resources and dropped a crate, and they couldn't do anything to to get rid of the crate without dying. So tech is very strong. Worst case, you can uh, play him turn one. He'll be a two three which isn't great, but it is an option if you feel like you need to. So tech is very good. Wreckers in there as a one of, I really went back and forth about whether I wanted to do, wanted Wrecker in the main or not. I've got one in the sideboard. I ended up sticking with it. I think Wrecker is one of those cards. It feels bad when it turns off your curve because if you drop him at five, like if you do the Han thing where you drop him at five resources and now he's a seven, four, if you do the the ability to kill a resource, now you're down to four resources. So now you, you're two turns away from the Luke turn. But sometimes to be able to do that when you have five resources and to kill the Sabine before it gets dark sabered or to kill the Battlefield Marine that's been wing leadered or whatever, um, you, you it just gives you more time to get to that top end. Cause sometimes if you don't do it, then you're you're screwed. So I, I like the one of Wrecker. I, I never really regretted having Wrecker in that spot. I, I feel like he was mostly useful. And then, you know, sometimes it's just dropping a six cost unit. If you just straight up play it and don't do it, then it's a seven, six with overwhelm. They, they feel like they need to do something about. So I liked having the one of Wrecker. And then I have the one of Baze Malbus in the main deck. The reason I did this is because I did expect a lot of Sabine. And one of my favorite plays to just mess with Sabine's flip turn is to drop drop bays at four and claim and just have them try to figure out how to get around bays without using units because he has Sentinel and he has Grit. So most of their stuff can't kill it in one shot unless they've like 
fleet lieutenant or wing leader Sabine or Battlefield Marine or something like that. But it it presents a lot of issues and there were a lot of turns where they decide not to flip Sabine or flip Sabine but not attack and those are all good things. Just get us to our top end. So Baze creates some problems. Uh, occasionally he can create problems for a Boba Fett but a lot of Boba decks are running shoot first. So with their four attack guys, uh, Baze is not an issue but sometimes it does create issues which I'm all about. Next up, we got our standard fare. Nothing too crazy here. You know, A-Wing, Arc, Sabine, open fire, all standard set one stuff. Running a two open fire, I could even go up to three, honestly. I think the deck can, if you can survive that early game and just kill stuff that hits the board and get to your top end, you're in good shape. So a lot of what I'm doing with these units is just trading as much as I can. And so, uh, so the, they're just good cards. In fact, I think with the rise of Kira, I think three open fire might be a good call anyways because when on her flip you can kill her for three resources because she's got four health left and not have to worry about anything weird or losing your leader or whatever on her flip take down another great removal we got a couple new cards in concord don interceptor's got a couple of those i'm 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 kind of 50 50 on this card i think it's fine it's not bad sometimes i just would put it there in front of a tie defender and be like okay you can lose your shield attacking in the first time and the second time we're trading which is fine uh, there were times even just putting this in front of a fire spray was good enough to just slow them down again not usually a unit you want to cheat in unless you know they drop let's say they drop an a-wing and it's an aggro deck then you can play this first turn so it's like hey if you you have to kill me if you don't then i'll kill you and i we won't trade so there there you could also just claim and drop that next turn it's just, it's versatile, it's fine. Casting Andor, actually three of day one, and I cut one for tech because I realized I just wasn't playing casting as much as I thought. I, I played, I think, one super hard control deck in the two days, so I think it was actually fine, but Cassian is a really great card, especially with Han, because if you don't draw uh, one of your first turn plays, but you have Cassian, you can actually cheat Cassian in as a 3-3 turn one, which is basically a battlefield marine type value. And if not, if it just goes in your resources and it comes out ready later, especially against control decks, that's very strong. Late game, if they're not expecting it, it can be damage out of nowhere. So Cassian is a very good card. Really love that guy. Moving on to the sideboard. All right, this was my sideboard again. I would probably make changes but I'll just talk you through what I did. I have a, a second base Malibus. The top row is all cards I already have, just I would add more of. Second base Malibus for the Sabine matchup and Boba usually. The third crate Dragon, especially for control matchups, definitely want the third one in there. The third open fire for Kira, second Wrecker. Usually I was putting in this Wrecker and taking out crate Dragons against Sabine um, to just have something that can nuke some units on play. I've got uh, two copies of Make an Opening. I wasn't sure how much Lurking Tie Phantom we were gonna see. So I had this in there. I was also messing with Mystic Reflection. It's the new one cost one, but kept this in there. It was fine. I think there was some play against some of the Kira stuff that they were doing where they would take damage, but they would shield the unit and this just gets around the shield and heals. So it's it was okay. It wasn't anything crazy. One copy of Vanquish for Fire Sprays, Dragons, malls things like that two copies of vigilance i actually did not like vigilance at either of the large events it it didn't it never felt good i think it it felt a lot better to be able to drop a wrecker at six than than vigilance and so i don't know i don't know if vigilance will stay in the sideboard for this i don't know if it's good enough at six anymore but i could be wrong and then i've got rivals fall in there Again, for crate dragons and malls and stuff, but also kills leaders. I was a little concerned about Boba Fett's with Boba's armor. And so I had it in there. I did, I was able to use this on a Darth Vader in the in the Vader matchup, which felt really, really strong as well. But also Vader's not that, if you can stick a Poe Dameron, Poe can actually one shot Vader as well and, and survive if you didn't cheat him out, which is pretty significant. So, so that's the sideboard I used for the day. Here's a list of possible changes. This is not an exhaustive list. It's just stuff that I'm considering right now. There were other players who played Han 2 Blue at Gen Con that placed higher than me who are probably smarter deck builders and smarter with this combination. So a hat tip to them for some of these ideas. I don't want to start naming them because I don't remember all their names and I don't want to leave someone out. 
but but if you know them feel free to drop them in the comments and give them a shout out carabash was actually a card i i had three of for a while and ultimately there were just too many times where it was a dead card where i cut it but then there are times i'm like i wish i had carabash to be able to to do early the the highest performing han blue deck was running carabash with r2d2 i think his name was frank and which is kind of ingenious because if you think about it you can cheat r2d2 in turn one for free it's a zero cost thing and has two damage and then you can play Carabas to just straight up kill an A-Wing, Sabine, Baffle Marine, anything that isn't shielded, you can just kill on turn one, which is which is pretty wild. So Carabas R2D2 is an interesting possibility. Mace Windu, another top end one. So if you're looking at the deck, you're like, man, I, I want to play this, but I don't have Lukes or I don't have crates or whatever, you could throw in Mace Windu. You could cheat him in at six, then he's a five five with ambush killing something and then readying. I don't know if that's amazing, but if you want to play the deck a little bit more aggressively, it's certainly an option. You could kill a couple units with just Mace Windu. Village Protectors. So not super impressive unit, just 2-2 with uh, Sentinel and Shielded, where sometimes you just put put these, these villagers in front of all your damaged units and say, it's going to take you a minute to get them unless you have clear removal from your hand. So. I, I don't think this is a unit you cheat out. I don't think you give up that shield, but it, it in a pinch, it could be. So I'm I'm thinking about it. Fell the Dragon is in there just as a, if crates, crate dragons, and uh, honestly, we saw a lot of Maul because of the Cure Green out there as well. You know, uh, Vader units, things like that. I just like takedown overall, but Fell the Dragon certainly has its, its uses. The Force is with me. So because I'm so heavy in the Force package already, there is a scenario in which maybe having forces with me is a good idea. I could play Kanan at three resources as a 4-3, then take initiative. First action, second round, I could play forces with me, you know, boost Kanan back up to a 6-5 with a shield and hit base or hit a unit, heal some stuff. It could be pretty sick. So it's a, it's a possibility. I already mentioned R2-D2. And then this last one, I actually got to give a shout out to uh, old Matty Gem, but he's he was testing Razor Crest with top target. And I thought that is interesting because you could play Razor Crest as, uh, at three and as a three, two with restore two and bring back a uh, top target. And top target is just a really cheap healing kind of thing where if you can stick that on, uh, especially a unique unit and heal four, heal six, it might be what replaces vigilance in the sideboard, and maybe Razor Crest comes in instead of the instead of the Conquer Dawn interceptors. I don't know. I don't know. It's just it's interesting, and I may decide to try it at some point. So you feel free to tinker as well. So with your help, we can make Sad Han a Happy Han. Everybody, the dude has had a tough tough go, but I believe together we can make Sad Han a Happy Han. So hope you enjoyed this deck tech. I hope you enjoyed hearing about some choices. I'm sure many of you out there are working on other variations of this. I'd love to see in the comments. What are you doing? What do you? What have you enjoyed? What are you sneaking out that uh, that needs another look? And and let's see what we can do with this deck. Thanks so much for watching, guys, and hope to see you in the next one. Bye.